Good morning. Welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRN AM for Thursday, May 20th, 2021. And our top story today, China's pension funds face rising risks. Well, joining me now to discuss this and a lot more is Katya Hanawalt. She is Director of Asia Focus Research at the ARC Center of Excellence in Population Aging Research. Katya, so great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. It's a pleasure to be here and a um, warm greeting from Sydney, Australia. Yeah, and, it, and, I, and I should say that it's morning here in the U.S., but where you are in Australia is in the evening, and we certainly appreciate your flexibility in joining us. We, we haven't mastered the time zone, even though we've mastered digital connectivity. So uh, let's, let's jump right in because you and your team at ARC and specifically where you focus your time and attention is in Asia and on population aging. And I couldn't help but reach out to you because you've done a lot of research around China. And from what I've read, both in your paper and in some in papers, excuse me, and research, and also in the popular media, China is facing a lot of risks as it relates to population aging. And this has an impact on retirement, consumption benefits. So why don't you go ahead and start, why don't you weigh in and give us your, your take on this? Yes, so there's this saying, demography is destiny, and that's certainly true for China. So China has seen just very, very rapid increases in life expectancy in the past few decades, and uh, a, lo- a, a very big drop in fertility. So in the 1960s, uh, fertility rates were above five per woman, and, and they dropped. And and then there was the one-child policy, and then ex- that accelerated accelerated a trend of having fewer children and and um, so people have fewer kids but um, the, there's an older generation where people had many kids and that older generation is about to retire and it's like an aging tsunami and um, at the so, so China is is going through a very very rapid um, demographic transition much faster than European countries or um, other developed countries around the world and at the same time China is still a middle income country um, so when we look at life expectancy. Life expectancy in China was 77 years last in 2019 and in the US just uh, over 78 years. So not, not not much of a difference, but in terms of an income, a huge difference. And so there's um, it's very interesting to, and because it's very d- dynamic and there's lots of policies going on to address this. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, and, and, you know, to touch on that, I mean, I think I was reading a study here. It is, it says China's over 60 population is projected to rise to three 100 million people. That's the size of the United States today in 2025. Um, you know, the, these, and, and you, you alluded to this, I mean, there's aging going on everywhere. We are an aging world, but both in Europe and the U.S., but this has put constraints and strains around retirement and pensions, right? I mean, there's a lot of outstanding liabilities with these uh, public pension systems in China. So just last week, we, we had um, uh, the, the census uh, for 2020 announced. And, and what we've seen is that Chinese population is growing much slower um, than in previous decades. And we were probably close to the point where the population of China is peaking and then it will start to decline. But what's interesting is that the working age population has already started to decline since um, 2012. So there's fewer and fewer people of working age that have to support a larger um, older population. and um, at the moment, China's pension system is is a lot um, based on pay as you go redistribution, and if there's fewer people to contribute to a system, um, also to health insurance systems, um, then uh, but more people uh, expecting benefits, then it's just going to be difficult financially. Yes. When you look at the data, um, and again, you you know you you focus on this all the time. You're getting, I guess, government data. Is there a breakdown in terms of, you know, China, part of China is rural, part of, you know, and there are big cities, uh, obviously, big urban centers, but is there a disparity when you look at the data between the urban area and the rural area? Um, and is that a concern for policymakers? So that's that's a very interesting question. So we we have done some modeling around healthy life expectancy, how many years you can expect to live before you start uh, to see um, age-related disabilities. And the, the, the variation across China is just 
huge. And so there is for life expectancy, the variation is about 12 years between provinces and healthy life expectancy 10 years. So, so you can think of some provinces, they have life expectancies and healthy life expectancies like countries in Europe, like Sweden, but other, other provinces of China, other parts of China have um, life expectancies like um, poorer countries like Egypt in, in Africa. And so there's, it's when you think of China, it's a, it's a country of 1.4 billion people and there has been so much economic development, but there are still areas that regions that need to catch up. And then there's just a lot of um, different economic development and different health development. And so a lot of variation and that, and that poses challenges. Um, at the moment, a lot of the pension funds are organized at the regional level, at the province level, we would call them states, I guess, in, 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 Europe, uh, in the US. But so they're, they're the pension funds, they are at the state level, but the benefits differ um, substantially. And there's a potential to unify this and make it more consistent. Mm -hmm. And, and you bring that up in terms of the regional nature and, and mm -hmm. you know, and you made the analogy to the U.S. states and local governments. And we've seen here this this merger um, a lot of in a lot of states that have underfunded pensions. You've seen maybe that the, the state pick up a local government if there's a local government that is underfunded or ha having some difficulties managing their pension assets. Uh, I would assume that. I think you kind of alluded to this that that, that aggregation is is occurring, um, and it, but that does does that really stem the tide? Is that really going to turn things around, or is that just a temporary band aid? I know we're going to talk about the potential overhaul in China in our second segment, but just kind of teeing this up, does that get China to a place where it's it's uh, solvent in terms of its pension obligations? Uh, look, there has been there's just constant reform, and um, the 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 the, pen, the whole pension system has expanded a lot in the last years. I think the first challenge or the first priority to was to give very very broad access, and and they have established a pension system that now covers almost a billion people, of one point wow. four billion, which is quite amazing for just the huge size of the country and the, the regional um, differences. Um, and I think the ex and then the next step is increasing the benefits. And and I guess um, having sort of like similar um, benefits and similar um, systems is it's it's desirable. But but just think of the sheer size of the country. And, and it's it, there. It's, it, I, I think there is a, a clear um, wish to do that. And, and, and uh, um, the, we have heard this in recent announcement that there's an a, a, that they are aiming towards a unified system but it's 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 going to take some time mm -hmm. yeah it, look I, I to see where china has come uh you know since i guess the 60s or 70s when it was kind of reintroduced to the west it's absolutely stunning both in terms of growth of population but also productivity labor those are different issues that we probably don't have enough bandwidth and time on this show to talk about, but it, it has really grown exponentially. Let me ask you just to kind of tee up our second segment about reform. Um, I was reading that they, they, meaning China, in order to sustain the economy, I think some challenges going on, obviously with the pandemic, they were actually diverting contributions that would go to the pension to other, other areas. And they do have a form of subsistence like social security like we have here in the US and social security mm -hmm. that 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 diversion that diversion of funds i mean that that has a dramatic impact on solvency as well so when I, I guess for this is it helps to understand the system a bit better, um, and then we should talk about how it's funded and and what how, and, and a lot of it is is pay as you go contributions coming in and being paid out as benefits. Um, look, I mean the, there is a, a, always a tension between having a, a lot of funding for social security, but at the same time having an economy that that works. And and if a country is facing economic recession or not recession or low economic growth I think I've we've seen in, in many countries pressure to to make labor costs and product production costs lower and and I guess that has motivated um, some fee cutting and tax cutting um, initiatives that that have lowered the contributions but at the same time I mean I'm from Germany and and we we had programs to keep people just employed during the recent global financial crisis and 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 and, and employment and, and economic growth is also important for well-being of individuals for the current workers so there's trade definitely trade-offs that need to be considered 
Yeah. Well, Katya, I want to take a very quick break. When we come back, we'll talk to Katya about China's pension system getting a potential private overhaul. You're going to want to stay tuned right here on BRN AM. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses. I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Are you stuck with a low credit score? A credit report and score that's causing you to be denied credit or pay higher interest rates than others for the same things? Then do what Terrence did and call Credit Repair for your free credit evaluation to help restore your credit. I started thinking about buying a new house and my score wasn't where I needed it to be. I called and spoke with one of the representatives and we just had a good conversation and I, I liked what he was saying. Just one call for his free credit evaluation was all it took to start back on the track to repairing his credit. I'm seeing the deletions and I'm getting the report so I know something's being done. It does make a difference to me. All it takes is one call to get started. Credit repair has given me a second chance to have a better credit score. Don't let a low credit score hold you back another day. Do what Terrence did and make the call for your free credit evaluation. Call 800-819-4152. That's 800-819-4152. Again, 800-819-4152. Welcome back. We're talking to Katya Hanawald of ARC Center of Excellence in Population Aging Research. Katya, thanks so much for staying with us this morning. My pleasure. It's so good to be here. Yeah, it's great. And, and this is great. You know, we were talking offline in the green room, the quasi green room and uh, the virtual green room about how you know, we we're trying to give the audience here in the States and around the world a look at different pension systems and that I think we'll educate people, including policymakers, about maybe some best practices. Let's look at the Chinese pension reform. Uh, I think they're really taking a hard, fast look at privatizing some or all of this. What can you tell us about what that could look like? Okay, um, so the Chinese pension system consists of different tiers or pillars. I prefer the word tiers because pillars sounds like they're all the same, but what actually is um, happening in China is that the first part, the first tier, um, government provided pensions are the, the most important component. So um, there, and this is, so there's a pension fund or a pension scheme for people who are employed in government, um, um, in government roles, in, in public um, enterprises or in private enterprises, so basically for urban employees. And then there's another pension scheme for, for residents, residents in rural areas or people in cities without a formal employment. And so these are the two large um, government provided pension schemes and they cover um, about 900, close to 1, 1 billion, um, 900 million, close to 1 billion people. Um, but then there's a very, very, very underdeveloped second and third pillar. So the second pillar is occupational pensions. So we know that there's some enterprise annuities, but maybe just about a few, like 
25 million people are participating in that, which is a good number compared to the size of a country like Australia. But for a large co country like China with one, over 1.4 billion people, it's, it's very small numbers. And the third pillar is private and um, voluntary savings. Um, now, the government wants to, has announced that it wants to really develop a multi-tier structure um, for the pension system to support and supplement the, the government pensions with um, occupational and private savings. Um, but this is these are plans and, and they're working on it and they've authorized some pilots, different pilot projects around the country to test this. Um, but there, yeah, I think this will take some time. The end of the second pillar, the enterprise annuity has been around for a few years um, and there was some growth, but recently there hasn't been so much new um, companies joining this, that private scheme and, and new um, people joining that. So I'm, I'm, I'm very curious to see what the development will be in the third tier with private um, pensions. Uh, we've done some research on it and there's some interest, but uh, there's also a lot of challenges as we know from other markets. And in terms of kind of what they're basing, you know, there's lots of defined contribution, what I would call defined contribution or privatized systems uh, around the world. Obviously, you have one where you are in Australia, the superannuation. There's a, a, a plan in the UK and, and clearly the 401k I'll just call it the 401k system here in the U.S. Do you have an idea of at least a direction that they're going? Uh, are they leveraging best practices from all of these? And, and if so, um, what's do they have an idea on timetable? <laughs> so I, um, I'm interested in a range of policies that um, are being tested and tried in, in China, uh, including long-term care insurance, including um, schemes to use housing wells to draw a pension. And my experience has been that different that the, the government authorizes different pilot projects that are being tested around the country for long-term care insurance. We've seen maybe over 15 different pilot programs in different cities, and I expect the same will happen with um, these private pensions for the third tier of the pension, the Chinese pension system, so that there will be different attempts. I've, I've, read, I've read some exciting um, development from um, this from Zhejiang province and Chongqing um, province, where they're trying on a special commercial pension insurance. Um, so usually they, they, they would try it on a smaller scale and see how it works out. And after a few years, maybe extend that pilot and maybe after a few more years, maybe make it as a nationwide uh, policy. But I think at the moment it's in the development and testing phase. And and um, we'll, we will see how it plays out. That. Yeah, I so think it's it going to be take interesting. Some time. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I think it's going to be no, interesting no. to see how they, you know, when you move to a defined contribution or privatized system, um, and I'd be interested to get your feedback. I'm interested to get your feedback on this. There's a big educational component around this. So number one, you've got to educate people about how the system works. That's number one. Number two, do they need to have some level of financial experience or literacy. Um, and again, you've got that, you know, the different thought processes, you've got rural and urban areas. Um, but, but what about that aspect of this? I mean, this is not going to be, as we found here in the U.S. over the last 40 years, it's not an easy transition to go to a defined contribution environment or privatized system. There's a lot of aspects to education. I wonder if you have any sense mm. for how that could be tackled by the, uh, the Chinese yes. government. Absolutely. So, um, so uh, just to 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 my my understanding is that they're they're not actually trying to re replace the government pensions, but just to ex ex basically make it a more comprehensive pension system with different funding sources for individuals in retirement. So, I think that the employees' pension and the residents' pension that are the most important two programs at the moment will continue to exist. But what they perhaps want to um, develop is um, like more a private market in addition to supplement for those who can afford to make private contributions um, in addition to these basic coverages from these existing pension funds. And so I think these there's, they want to introduce these on top and to have a multi-tier system as we see in other countries. Um, now, of course, with private savings and private pensions, there's multiple factors, behavioral challenges, um, product understanding is a factor that drives demand. And of course, we're aware of the whole big research around the annuity puzzle, all these theoretical studies that show us that private annuities should be very desirable for consumers, but then no take-ups in reality. And, and, and from the academic research, we know that 
a lot of factors contribute to this. Um, and I think my advice usually is to work on the product design and the product presentation. Um, I don't think we can mandate people to take financial literacy classes. Um, so it, it's, I think that the burden or the should be on the, whoever provides these programs, the companies who want to offer these products, make sure that they are easy and clear to understand and attractive to consumers. And um, I think research can provide ways, presentation formats, case studies, and we have tested different ways of explaining these products. And so, yeah, it's, I think it's, it's it is a challenge in every country and i mean education levels are changing very quickly in in china um, so, and people are using their smartphones and i think that's uh, probably the, the the challenges for providers are similar as in other countries i would argue yeah it's going to be interesting i think you know as you mm -hmm. know from from covering not only asia but the, the you know looking at population and research there's compliance there's investment there's fee, there's education. Uh, that, it's a huge undertaking and it, and it never ends. Well, Katja, we're going to have to leave it there. It is an absolute pleasure to chat with you. Appreciate you coming on the program. And look, as you develop new research, we'd love to have you back on the program. Have a great rest of your week and we'll talk to you again very soon. Thank you. And um, all the best from Sydney, Australia, and hope to talk, to, talk soon again. Bye-bye. And that wraps up this episode of BRN AM. Have a topic of interest, someone you think we should talk to, then drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the information in retirement markets, technology, personal finance, so much more, check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse. We're back again tomorrow with another exciting, entertaining, and educational edition of BRNAM. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes. Are you being audited and do you owe the IRS $10,000 or more in back taxes? Is the IRS threatening to take more of your money? Don't fight the IRS alone. The Tax Doctor is here to help you negotiate your tax bill and reduce your stress. The IRS can freeze your assets and seize your bank accounts, but you can stop these IRS actions. The Tax Doctor will work with you using our years of experience to represent your case to help you get the best resolution under the IRS guidelines. Help is here to deal with the IRS to reduce your stress. We've handled thousands of cases, so we know what we're doing. If you owe $10,000 or more in back taxes, do not call the IRS alone. Call a Tax Doctor now for a tax emergency analysis. Call 800-224-6439.